the challenge began in Minnesota against the eventual NFC champions. Darrell LaMonica started at quarterback and hit number 49 Mike Ciani with six passes as Oakland gained 353 yards against the vaunted Purple Gang. Top draft choice Ray Guy mocked his pro debut with a 50-yard punting average, while number 43 George Atkinson put the Raiders on the board with an electrifying punt return. But in the end, veteran Fran Tarkington and Rookie of the Year Chuck Foreman spearheaded the Vikings' 24-16 win over the silver and black. Minnesota quarterback Fran Tarkington was coming off a great preseason in which he led the Vikings to five wins against no defeats. Oakland signal caller Daryl LaMonica had witnessed the defeat of his Raiders by the Vikings in the third preseason game. And he found little, if any, yardage early against the Purple Gang. When the Oakland quarterback went to the air, the Purple People Eaters really put on pressure. LaMonica was stalked, hurried, and flushed out of the pocket by the front four consisting of Carl Eller, Bob Lertzema, Alan Page, and Jim Marshall. With the Vikings leading three to nothing, Tarkington found John Gilliam for Minnesota's first touchdown. Raiders rallied on the legs of number 44, Marv Hubbard. Two George Blanda field goals narrowed the score. The Raiders specialty team gave Oakland their first lead of the afternoon. George Atkinson's 60-yard twisting punt return gave the Raiders a 13-10 halftime lead. In the third quarter, Daryl LaMonica went for broke. Mike Ciani's super reception was ruled dead at the Minnesota 30, and the Raiders were threatening again. With second goal at the Minnesota one, Oakland battered three times against the stiff Minnesota front wall, but never penetrated. A third George Blanda field goal lengthened Oakland's lead. Behind excellent protection, Tarkington brought the Vikings back, teaming up with number 83, tight end Stu Voigt. Tarkington capped the six-play drive, finding first-round draft choice Chuck Foreman for the go-ahead score. Following an Oakland fumble, Tarkington called on number 30, Bill Brown for the Minnesota clincher. Monica's fourth quarter efforts wound up buried under a wave of purple shirts. Minnesota 24, Oakland 16. The Oakland Raiders move on to play the world champion Miami Dolphins this week, while the Vikings will travel to Soldier Field in Chicago to battle the black and blue division Chicago Bears. The next Sunday found coach John Madden and the Raiders at California Memorial Stadium against the world champion Miami Dolphins. 
The order of battle was set early as Dan Connors blacked out Larry Zonka's power. Then number 77, Bubba Smith and the young Raider defensive unit turned off the light of flashy runner Mercury Marks. Oakland played errorless football in over 74,000 appreciative fans, largest crowd to ever see a pro game in Northern California, knew Miami's record 18-game win streak was in danger. Number 23, Charlie Smith, and number 44, Marv Hovett, rampaged Goldwood. Four times this duo drove within field goal range. Four times astute coach John Madden called on veteran George Blander. George was unerring and coupled with superb defense and determined special teams, he helped earn the mighty Raiders a 12-7 streak-snapping conquest of the world champions. The Miami Dolphins, led by coach Don Shula, were out to break a record by winning 19 straight games. But the largest crowd ever to witness a Raider football game, over 74,000, thought it was time for someone to bone the Dolphins. Putting Miami on the skids is no easy task, as the Raider offense, which hasn't scored a touchdown yet this year, soon found out. Jake Scott, number 13, stopped this drive, but the Raiders' big D lashed back with relentless pursuit. The only thing rarer than a Miami mistake is a Miami mistake made by Larry Zonka. The Raiders not only forced Larry to fumble, but recovered it and got the ball in close enough for the ageless one George Blanda to boot his first of four field goals. The Oakland defense continued to hound the Dolphins converging in packs and swarms to smother Miami's sputtering offense. The Oakland offense itself was not overwhelming, but four times they cranked it up and got 46-year-old George into position. George's fourth field goal gave him seven for seven for the year and gave the Raiders a 12-0 lead. It wasn't until late in the fourth quarter that Bob Greasy was able to crack the silver and black defense. This throw to number 88, Jim Mandich. But the touchdown with 107 left wasn't enough as the Oakland Raiders snuffed the Miami win streak at 18 with an inspired 12 to seven victory. In week three in unfriendly Kansas City, Oakland faced the first of five straight grueling road games. Number 28, Clarence Davis, darted on a 76-yard kickoff return, but the Raiders registered only three points. The powerful Chiefs managed only three field goals themselves, as punter Ray Guy's cloud-clipping shots boomed into the land of no return. The Oakland defense held the hard-won ground savagely. But with only two minutes left to play, a deflected pass sealed the Raiders' fate. The 16-3 loss to the Chiefs left Oakland with one win in three games. With four straight road games still ahead, Raider character would be severely tested. Before last week's meeting with Oakland, most of the so-called experts had already buried the Kansas City Chiefs. They hadn't been able to stop the Rams in the opener, 
They hadn't been able to score more than one touchdown against the Patriots in week two. They were, as the experts said, too old, too ready to look for a place to lie down. And if any team could put them out of their misery quickly, it would be the arch rival Raiders from Oakland. Clarence Davis covered 76 yards in one bolt, but this was to be the only long play of the game. The rest of the day belonged entirely to the men of the defense, particularly to the much maligned men of the Kansas City defense. They were ready for the men in silver and black and especially ready for the ultimate quarry, quarterback Daryl LaMonica. For the most part, LaMonica's strategy was to hand off to his runners like Marv Hubbard, number 44. The Raiders ran 25 times, but gained only 77 yards. And sometimes even an attempted handoff got LaMonica into hot water with the Chiefs front four. Through three quarters of the game, LaMonica hung in and took his punishment from the inspired Kansas City rush line. In the fourth quarter, lefty Ken Stabler was called to the rescue, but it was all the same to the Chiefs' defense. Lynn Dawson did not have things much easier on the Chiefs' side. Tough as it was, six times Dawson got the Chiefs close enough for Jan Stinnerud to attempt a field goal. Once he was short, twice he was blocked, but three of his kicks were converted into nine points for the Chiefs. Trailing by six with two minutes to play, Ken Staber dropped back and passed short to Pete Banizak. The ball was deflected and Willie Lanier gratefully returned the gift for the clinching score. Perhaps a fitting conclusion to a game in which neither team could put across an offensive touchdown. In fact, the Raiders' offense has yet to score its first touchdown of the season. As Raider coach John Madden stated after the game, I've heard the Chiefs were on the way down, but that's not true. They're number one now. Hank Stram and the Chiefs will settle for that any day. Even in St. Louis, there were some budding Raider fans who were partial to at least the oldest part of Oakland's phantom offense. What the silver and black attack needed and got was a new commander in the person of number 12, Kenny Stabler. But sometimes even Stabler didn't look like the answer. Cardinals jumped to an early lead as Jim Hart dropped back and looped one to Jackie Smith, who made a great catch in the corner. A repeat of the play shows how tough Jackie Smith is, even when presented with the maximum in harassment. Cardinals came up with some imaginative innovations in the wide open offensive attack presented by coach Don Coriel. When all the razzle dazzle ended, however, it was the Oakland defense that proved basics are best as they crunched the Cardinals with an intimidating defensive display. Number 84, Tony Klein was the rating party leader.
And once intimidated, St. Louis began to give up their scoring opportunities as twice they dropped passes in the end zone. Finally, Stabler got the Oakland offense untracked. After 14 quarters without a touchdown, he led them on two long drives to two short touchdown runs. The drives were made up of short, less than exciting plays, but they proved that somewhere beneath those silver and black shirts, there beats an offense of old. Last week, a 17-10 lusterless win over St. Louis. This week, now that they've got it going, perhaps the Raiders will show that old flair for the end zone. While the Raiders have switched from Daryl LaMonica to Ken Stabler, the Chargers have switched to number 14 rookie Dan Fouts from John Unitas. Last week in the early going, Fouts to number 81 Ron Holiday began some razzle-dazzle explosives. The Charger defense wasn't above a little razzle-dazzle of its own as number 24 Bob Howard came up with this theft. Then Fouts toss and go to number 37 Sid Edwards looked like a touchdown. But on the way, Sid was out of bounds so the Chargers had to crank it up again. This time, Fouts went to number 86, Jim Thaxton, and San Diego led 10 to 6. The Raiders led at 13 to 10, but Dan Fouts brought the Chargers back when he hit number 25, Jerry Levias, who made a tough grab. Replay shows just how hard Jerry had to fight to get possession of the ball and the San Diego 17 to 13 lead. But eventually the relentless silver and black defense began to shut plays down almost before they began. Number 77, Bubba Smith, was among the quickest of the Raiders and seems to be adding more and more to the team as each game passes. Although Fouts kept going for the Raider goal, the silver and black had decided that he was through for the day. Then number 12, Ken Stabler brought Oakland charging on offense. He led them downfield on this series for a short one yard score and a 20 to 17 lead. Then the Raiders special team chipped in with a strip ball and a fumble recovery. Good play fake, a good pass to number 88, Bob Moore, and the Raiders had victory number three by a score 27 to 17. For Tim Rosovich and the Chargers, it was a fourth loss in five games and prospects for a long, hard season stretching ahead. Next, in a Monday night road game at Denver, the Raiders faced another team crusading to overtake them. 
24-year veteran George Blander became the first player to ever kick 300 field goals. But even more important kicks were yet to come. Three times the Raiders rallied from behind. An 80-yard bomb from Ken Stabler to Mike Ciani brought Oakland back once, and the Raider defense fought valiantly to protect the lead. Despite clutch plays like this interception by number 31, Jack Tatum, the rugged Broncos forged a 17-13 lead. Cliff Branch, a University of Colorado product, had a happy homecoming as he put Oakland ahead 20 to 17. Then, with Stabler injured, LaMonica came in and hit Branch to set up a final minute go-ahead field goal. But Denver came back to tie the game at 23, and Oakland's 3-2-1 record left the AFC Western Division title up for grabs. Four of six this year. On his way, George Atkinson at the goal line. Atkinson tripped up as he gets out over the 15-yard line. Stopped there by Marv Montgomery, pulling the clock to the right. And here comes Charlie Smith. Charlie Smith breaking tackles. He has the yardage for the first down. He's topped by Charlie Greer. Looking for Blitnikoff. Checks off. Uh -oh. Goes out to 21 Cliff Branch. And Branch, on a good catch, gets into Denver territory. He's at the 44, 26-yard game. They know about Cliff Branch around here. He's had a different colored jersey. First and 10 for Oakland. They're at the 44 of Denver. Marv Hubbard. Hubbard. We'll get six, call it five, it'll be second down. Well, we'll give him six. On a second down, a long three, the ball goes to Charlie Smith. Big hole, and he gets the first down, he's at the 30. Right now, it's second down at 10, the ball at the 30. Stabler, looking for Belitnikov, he can run. <laughs> looking for the first down mark, he gets it. 10-yard pickup, it'll be first and 10 for Oakland at the 20. He can enthusiasm, and they're playing good football. On second and 10, flooding backs both ways, and he just does get it off to Blitnikoff. Does Stabler, Blitnikoff has the first down, he's out of bounds at the 31. First and 10, moving from the 36. Stabler looking again, and a lot of pressure from Paul Smith. Oh, Paul yeah. Smith. We'll watch, 121 remaining in the first quarter. Denver out in front, seven to nothing. He got Stabler it. goes to Mike Ciani, complete. Just in midfield, it'll be first and 10 for Oakland. The ball now marked at the 48. Illegal procedure, second down and 15. And here comes Charlie Smith with a big hole and good. Running by Charlie Smith, he's close to the first down. Down to about the 39-yard line, 15-yard pickup. Good offensive call, Frank. A quick trap up the middle. It was second. Nothing. Stabler will take it on his own. He gets it. Whenever you're in trouble, give it to your power runner, Frank. And Stabler gets the first down as the gun is sounded. We're out in front, 7 0 as we begin the second quarter. Jimmy Stabler looking, he gets bopped again. Uh, it's a complete this time to his tight end, Bob Moore. Wide open, Frank. A lot of that Raymond Chester is. All right, this could be interesting. What's happening here? Oh, Charlie Smith on defense. first and 10, and he moves for a good yardage. Down good inside the 20 to the 17. Uh, looking for his 300th career field goal. He's 11 of 13 this year. There it is. He's got it. George Blanda. Uh, what can you say about this man? 46 years old. They're going to hold up and give him the football. And you know what he's going to do with that football, Don? No. I'll tell you. George Blanda, who is 46 years of age and who is a remarkable person, as I think every sports fan in the country knows, could take that football home and give it to his mother, Mary, who is 77 years old today. That's really nice. First and 10 from their own 20. Stabler looking for a receiver under pressure, and Ciani is all alone. Oh, Somebody wow. Fell down. I believe Calvin Jones fell down. 80-yard touchdown. Well, let's not fool around about it. I'll no. guarantee you that. He was 15, 20 yards behind him. 
Little Calvin Jones, I believe, slipped and fell at midfield. Slips don't count. Here's Mike Ciani as he comes off. You've got number 21. That's Randy Montgomery that goes with him in the beginning. That's the guy that fell, but he was behind him going in. There's nobody back there in the middle. Well thrown ball. Good breaks tried. And now you got the Oakland Raiders out in front. Son of a gun. Two 80 yard quick. touchdowns here in Denver tonight. Bill Thompson's fumble return for 80 yards, and Ciani has just gone 80 yards as George Blanda comes on to Denver. They lead 10 to 7, 6 18 remaining in the first half. We'll be back. 323, second down along nine. Johnson having to get rid of it quickly, uh -oh, and Zach it's... Tatum. Well, then Zach Tatum deflected it, and who came up with it? Irons. Gerald, Gerald Irons. Irons. But there's a flag on the play. Let's see what. All right, second down and seven from their own 49. That travels Oakland. This is Marv Hubbard. Denver stacks it up pretty good, and he fights for about three on strictly on his own. Paul Smith made the stop in the backfield along with Charlie Smith. Going out to his favorite receiver, Fred Bolitnikoff. The ball was there, first down. Let's go again. He gets the first down of the 41. This time, Stabler dumps it off to Banizak. And Banizak dropped there by little Calvin Jones, number 26. He's he got a zone over there on that side. Let's see what happens to it. He wants Poletnikov, and he's they covered go. well. Oh, yeah, but oh, look at him. That's what he did. Frank. That's what he did a while ago. Just what you were talking about, coming back to the, re to the passer. He had a, a three-man zone with that safety. 6,000 yards in his career. 6,003. Here's Stabler on second down. A lot of pressure and getting in there is Lyle Alzado. Fourth time now, Stabler's been nailed. Yeah, on third down at the 21 of Denver. They have one timeout remaining. Stabler under pressure, and this Oh, goes, oh I can't God. believe it. How can it happen? How can it happen? Randy Montgomery, who fell down against Mike Ciani, had that one go right through his hand. Hustler <laughs> Denver will be trying to field goal. Landa from the 13. That's field goal number 301 in his career. And he extends Oakland's lead to 13 to 7. Oakland will move from their own 21-yard line. This is Stabler. Gets a good block. Protection. Gets it off to Bletnikoff. Well, we Bletnikoff said, has the first down to the 35. He did the same thing again, Frank. Uh, Stabler was pretty well pressured. He said Oakland Raiders. Moving from their 18. Marv Hubbard. Ray May is chasing. And finally, Charles Greer, number 20, drives Hubbard out of bounds. The identical play that he uh, fumbled on a time, uh, the play before, so he's running in the third quarter. Stabler looking out to Blitnikoff. He comes back again. Guts it as Randy Montgomery. Gets a handful of his jersey, and Blitnikoff goes down. But he has him at 33. The big fullback, Marv Hubbard, gets the call. Gets a good block, and he skips over the 40 to the 42. Calvin Jones made the stop along with help with Ray May. He is the opponent next Monday. Third down and one. Hubbard gets the call. He gets the first down, and he drags the tackler to midfield. Number 20, Charlie Greer coming up. But they trail 17 to 13, does Oakland. Again, Boletnikov coming back. And Boletnikov is all the way to the 35 of Denver. 15-13 remaining in the third quarter. Kirk Branch has checked in. Number 21, Stabler likes to go deep to him. Now he'll run. Stabler hurdling one tackler over the 25 to the 22-yard line. <laughs> Little scored from one yard out. Trying to hit him a field goal. And as we watch Charlie Smith go off the right side, the score is Denver 17, Oakland 13. Dean of second down and four. From the 16. That's perishability right there. Cliff Branch, did he get it? Yes, he did. <laughs> he did. Just perish. Now throw it down, Cliff. Now do a little dance for us. Run no. back. I don't much like that throwing down, I guess. Touchdown, Cliff Branch, beating Randy Montgomery in the corner and a very fine pass by Kenny Stabler. Billy Van Heusen, Mamaronak High School, Maryland. And he gets off a pretty good kick. Tom Maxwell drops the ball. That's the break they needed. Recovering Ken Kreider. Ken Kreider getting down to make the recovery. All right, there's that difference between a muff and a fumble, and Frank, you do that better than Howard I, so go to it. Well, you just cannot advance it. This is in Washington, top of your screen, number 84. Here comes a reverse, Haven Moses. 
Oh, Haven. And Haven Moses running a lot of yards to pick up two. That's one of those things that might have been. Marv Montgomery, number 78, was the guy that tried to peel back. He's a left. Oh, he up to 20. Oh, yeah, and you were right. Give him, put him inside the 45-yard line. There's nobody more consistent in place kicking. I'm delighted to know that. Dan Turner. This is quick right. Johnson. Can he go back Charlie. wide? And he's going to go Ooh. down. Big Bubba Smith, number 77, getting help from Otis the Strunk. First time that they've Charlie's got to Charlie right, Johnson. Frank. It's the first time they've got to him. Smith, 23, Hubbard, 44, the setbacks. Oakland will try and get in a field goal position. Joseph Charlie Smith, he holds on. And Tom Graham makes the stop after Smith avoids a couple of Denver Broncos, a gain of 17, 37-yard line of Oakland. Marv Hubbard following Charlie Smith and gets away from one tackler, but he finally dropped by Lyle Alzado. For Hubbard, Banazak is checked in, number 40. This is Clarence Davis. And Davis scrambles for the first down. He's up near to midfield. Zach and Davis are the backs. Fly goes down. Holding. It could be holding. Good completion to Bob Moore, the tight end. If it's not holding, they are already in that field goal position, but I think you're right. They Clean were. up, Sean. Six. And, of course, coming up next week, Buffalo and Kansas City. On first and 25, and down goes Stabler. Getting in there again, Paul Smith, and what a game he's played from the Denver Broncos. And they're still pressing. Whoa. Kolitnikov with a fine catch near midfield, taken down by Randy Montgomery and Tom Graham. Kick. Plenty of distance. How do you like that? that? George Blandle, through all of the years, one of the incredible artisans of victory. And one of the great sights, Howard, is Kenny Stabler just being able to walk off the field. And part, a big part of kicking is the holder, and I've got to admire Stabler along with Blandle. The sidelines, former Notre Dame star. And that defensive unit for Denver has really played fine football. <laughs> all right. Another thriller on Monday night. Right down to the wire. Johnson with good pass protection. This is Floyd Little. That's oh yeah. Inside the 50, immediately time is called. 23 seconds remaining. Tony Klein got downfield to make the stop. Draw this time, play. draw play. Good call, Dawkins. Good yardage. Look at him pound. Inside the 40 to the 38 yard line. Well, now they've got the timeout. Position. Defense. He has one timeout remaining. He'll have to use that to stop the clock. And he gives a draw play to Little this time. Little driving inside the 30. Nine yard game. Well, that's it. They got nine seconds, seven. They got it. Seven seconds remaining on his way. There it is. Boy, that's pressure. What a finish. That means Oakland and Kansas City are tied for the lead in the Western Division. That means Denver stays alive. Just one game off the pace. But this game is going to mean a lot more, I suspect, for the Denver Broncos. This town and these players have thirsted for national recognition. They got it tonight, and they've given a performance that lives up to the opportunity presented. But right now, time has expired. It's over. tie here in Denver. What's the old line? A tie is like kissing your sister. I not here, that. not tonight, not for the Denver Broncos. A tie for them tonight, for their fans, I think is something a little more than that. I think it always depends on what your sister looks like, too. That's an element. You all are too much. We'll be back for a wrap-up, but again, the final score, Oakland 23, Denver 23. Now the Raiders were cross-country in Baltimore for a fifth straight road game. Ken Stabler hit Mike Ciani, Fred Blitnikoff, and Bob Moore with six passes each.
while completing 25 of 29 to set an all-time NFL completion percentage record. This record performance again brought to national attention the precision passing that has for so long been a feared weapon in the Raider arsenal. When the Colts tried to emulate Raider success, they ran into trouble from alert number 26, Alonzo Skip Thomas. With the Riddle Colt secondary playing deep, Clarence Davis rolled behind number 63, co-captain Gene Upshaw, for two scores and a 34-21 Oakland victory. Five straight away games. And yet, this young Raider squad had allowed but one game to result in defeat. Last Sunday, the Baltimore Colts took the field, a team in search of a solidifying experience. Unfortunately for them, they ran into a red-hot-handed Oakland quarterback named Ken Stabler, who has been newly instituted as a starter in place of Darrell LaMonica. Stabler led Oakland to a 13-0 lead on two field goals and a rainbow to Mike Ciani. The Colts stayed within striking range as number 14, Marty Domres, bombed wide receiver Glenn Doughty with a 40-yarder. And although Doughty didn't have the ball when he got up, he'd had it long enough for the six. But then Domrays made a fatal mistake by scrambling into the teeth of the Oakland defense. He ended up scrambled himself and out of the game for a spell. Meanwhile, Stabler continued to work like radar as he hit on 25 of 29 passes for 304 yards to break Sammy Baugh's all-time completion percentage record. At one point, he connected on 14 in a row, just one shy of the NFL record. His protection was perfect as he hit number 88, Bob Moore, to increase the silver and blacks lead. It seemed someone was always open as time after time the snake hissed his passes into the seams of the Colts' zone defense. Raider radar was supplemented by the ground forces as number 28, Clarence Davis, put Oakland ahead 27-7. But the Colts came roaring back on the strength of some big plays. This one by Don McCauley. A one-yard score by Lydell Mitchell was followed by a successful onside kick, and the Colts were threatening. Marty Domrez to X-Raider Raymond Chester brought Baltimore to within six at 27-21, and an upset seemed imminent. But the Oakland Raiders have got their offense together now, and Clarence Davis put the game away on this 32-yard jaunt to make Ken Stabler's fine performance a victorious one, 34-21. Coach John Madden skillfully unfolded a devastating game plan. Against New York, Raider superiority was evident from the opening whistle. Yard by yard, man by man, point by point, Oakland vanquished the Giants in a surge of raw power.
The defense with linebacker Gerald Irons, number 86, leading the way, knifed in on the Giants like sharks in a frenzy. Down after down, the Raiders displayed the intensity of a proud team in search of its ninth consecutive winning season. Monica came in and whistled one to wide receiver Steve Sweeney. It finished the Giants 42 to nothing and raised Oakland's record to 5-2 and 1. It was the first meeting ever between the Giants and Raiders and in the golden west of the Oakland Alameda Stadium the silver and black rolled out the welcome mat. Then they pulled the mat from under the New Yorkers as Clarence Davis opened the scoring floodgate on this five-yard touchdown run behind number 63, Gene Upshaw's block. The Oakland defense came in crushing waves and completely scattered the Randy Johnson-led giant offense. Then Kenny the Snake Stabler lofted Oakland's touchdown number two of the day to his tight end, Bob Moore. When New York got the ball again, Johnson threw the first of four giant misdirected passes. Oakland's Namaya Wilson picked this one off and was only stopped from scoring by Johnson himself. Marv Hubbard finally took it in for Oakland on an eight-yard cruncher that brought the Giants down to size. When number 23, Charlie Smith, came in with a play, he quickly cut the Giants off at the knees as he made a bobbling catch to bring the score 28 to nothing. Silver and Black Marauders continued to plunder the ball as Gerald Irons stole this pass, which in turn led to another Marv Hubbard blockbuster. Norm Snead replaced Johnson as New York's quarterback, and his offense was quickly welcomed to a hard time. was pulverized on the ground and hounded in the air as number 43 George Atkinson tracked his pass down and put the rampant Raiders in the goal position one last time. And then for old time's sake, Darrell LaMonica lofted a buzz bomb to number 89 Steve Sweeney. It's proved in this instance that East was East, but West was best by a score of 42 to nothing. Against playoff bound Pittsburgh, the Raiders were plagued by turnovers and penalties, and Ken Stabler suffered a knee injury. Behind Darrell LaMonica, Oakland slashed for nearly 400 yards against the prestigious Steeler defense. Despite this display of strength, the Raiders scored only nine points. And as things went awry, Oakland suffered its third loss of the 1973 season. But 
while the 17 to 9 defeat was damaging. Welcome to the genuine grass field of the Oakland Coliseum, where wonders never cease. How often have you seen a punter run from his own end zone, breaking four tackles along the way? Ray Guy now has a lifetime pro rushing average of 21 yards, but he was the reliable part of the Oakland kicking game. The AFC's leading passer, Ken Stabler, could play only the first quarter due to a banged up knee. And suddenly, the AFC's top-rated offensive machine was missing its main cog. As an older quarterback looked on, the responsibility was passed to quarterback number three, Darrell LaMonica, a younger old quarterback who did manage to stir up some occasional fireworks with his once-renowned arm. Late in the fourth quarter, LaMonica put up Oakland's only touchdown with an old-fashioned bomb to Fred Boletnikoff. The old-fashioned Raider glory was short-lived, however, as for most of the afternoon, LaMonica was entertaining visitors in the Oakland backfield. Number 68, L.C. Greenwood, was one of the most persistent. He even stole poor Darrell's handkerchief. When the left end, Greenwood, was not pestering LaMonica, usually it was the right end who was. Dwight White, number 78. Dwight White was literally all over the field. Watch the right end, number 78. White grabbed two of LaMonica's four interceptions, one of which, as we can see in a replay, was caused by Joe Green, number 75. LaMonica's Pittsburgh counterpart, number five, Terry Hanratty, didn't have a great day either. But he capitalized on what the defense gave him enough times to make a lot of people in Oakland miserable indeed. And so, two former Notre Dame quarterbacks met in the marshland at Oakland. And this time, number five was the winner by a score of 17 to nine. The bruising defensive struggle with Cleveland the following week was even more costly. Both defenses played tough, tight-fisted football. If you were lucky, you were able to crawl away. For the silver and black, this 7-3 loss seemed deadly because that night, when the scores were in, the Raiders stood third in the AFC West and many thought they were finished. Although there were no serious injuries in the game, there were any number of devastating collisions. Monopolizing that aspect of the game was the Cleveland Browns defense, who seemed to absorb anyone wearing black. And when the gang tackling failed, it was back to the big hit. Unable to advance beyond their own 49-yard line in the first half, the Raiders seemed to be getting picked on by everyone. It seemed, even if an Oakland play developed well, it was inevitably earmarked for yet another divot in the Coliseum turf.
Kenny Stabler was sacked five times on a day which was filled with nothing but frustrations for the capricious Raider offense. Only by the virtue of a fourth quarter turnover were Stabler and crew able to move within field goal range to avoid the shutout. But just as the Oakland offense fizzled, so did the Browns on all but one game-determining march during which Mike Phipps emerged to supply the needed drive. Twice he connected with veteran receiver Frank Pitts, number 25, for first downs and good yardage. Then the get with it quarterback dropped back and hit number 44, Leroy Kelly on the Oakland 11 yard line. And by that time, Oakland Cleveland relationships were at a new low. One play later, Phipps lobbed a perfect pass to number 43, Fair Hooker, for the game's only touchdown. A repeat shows all pro Willie Brown had his back turned and never knew where the ball was when Hooker made the reception. The win gives Cleveland a good shot at the AFC Central title and leaves Oakland a shocked and battered third in the West. With San Diego in Oakland, it was a must-win situation for the Raiders. The Chargers employed trick formations, but Coach Madden's competent staff had the silver and black poised and ready. Number 82, Horace Jones, and number 71, Kelvin Corver, pressured the Charger offense into big mistakes. The Raiders' conference-leading defense forced a miscue that safety man George Atkinson turned into a score, and the Chargers were never close. The defiant Raiders dug in and overpowered San Diego, 31 to three. The victory was crucial. Oakland's comeback tradition blended with a strong pride that would not allow this team to give an inch, despite the imposing obstacles that barred their charge to the division title. With this victory, the resurgent Raiders were now tied for second, but faced with yet another must-win in Houston. In Oakland, the cheering this season has definitely been an off-and-on thing for the roller-coastering Raiders. But last week, when the San Diego Chargers came out in one of their wildly creative offensive alignments, it was time for Oakland cheering. Number 43, George Atkinson, put the stopper on this bohemian play. It was Atkinson again when Robert Holmes fumbled, and this time George streaked 59 yards with a bobble to make it 7-zip. The Chargers charged back on a Wayne Clark hookup to Clint Jones, which brought them within range for a successful field goal. But three-point field goals were no match for silver and black sixes last week as Kenny Stabler to Mike Ciani started another Raider thrust. Ciani's fumble was after the whistle and it was just a short seven yards up the middle for 23 Charlie Smith to make it 17 to three. The San Diego punter then came up with another wily artistic play, which lacked in effectiveness, but deserved an A for effort. Taking advantage of this miscue, Kenny Stabler went to number 25, Fred Bolitnikoff in the end zone, 
and the Oakland lead expanded to 24 to 3. Number 88, Bob Moore, completed the Raiders' scoring outburst, which was 28 points better than their previous display. Last week, the Raiders' only consistent element stayed that way as the Oakland defense buried everything in sight wearing a white jersey. Now, if they can only hype their offense up to such dependable performances for the next couple of weeks, there may be some silver and black in the playoff picture yet. Oakland 31, San Diego 3. In the Astrodome in Houston, the Pride and Poise boys from Oakland were supposed to enjoy a cakewalk with the Houston Oilers, while their mortal divisional enemies, the Kansas City Chiefs and the Denver Broncos, were entertaining much tougher customers. But for most of this football game, the Pride and Poise boys looked more like Manny, Moe, and Jack trying to work out a Marx Brothers routine. The Raiders gave away the football four times as Kenny Stabler threw three interceptions, including this one, to number 58, Paul Guidry, and at halftime, Oakland left the field trailing Houston 3 0. Indeed, when the Oakland Raiders did manage to look like some semblance of pro football's dynamic organization, they managed to do some very un Oakland Raider like things to destroy the image. Still, the Raiders are a strong football team with many good players like Marv Hubbard, number 44. And because of this wealth of talent, they managed to control this game even though they played poorly. But the Houston defense gave a very creditable performance. And for most of the game, whenever the Raiders threatened to roll, the Oilers defense, led by number 65, Elvin Bethay, threw Kenny Stabler on the skids. At length in the fourth quarter, Snake Stabler connected with Fred Bolitnikoff for this 21-yard touchdown, making the score Raiders 10, Oilers 3. But Houston came right back and made it 10 to 6. And on their next possession, this screen up the middle from Dante Pastorini to number 40, Lewis Jolly, put them in position to retake the lead. But with first and goal at the two, Lewis Jolly fumbled away Houston's chance for a most rewarding upset. Phil Villapiano picked the ball out of the air and raced it 52 yards upfield. Villapiano's run set up a subsequent two-yard touchdown dash by Marv Hubbard, and the Raiders escaped misfortune in this comedy of errors, coming away with a 17-6 victory. It was a sloppy game filled with inexplicable happenings like this 72-yard punt by Ray Guy, which Jeff Severson failed to catch near his own 30-yard line. He certainly didn't lose the ball in the sun. Maybe he just wanted to see which way it would bounce, but with the Houston Oilers, he should have known. But even more unusual was the way the Raiders treated the football, like it was some strange object all day long. Against the Oilers, Marv Hubbard raced for 121 yards to contribute to a new rate of season rushing record of 2,510 yards. But the Raiders were in a rugged battle inside the Astrodome. The Oakland defense bent, but a touchdown saving effort by number 24, Willie Brown, epitomized Raider determination. And two plays later, the Houston scoring threat was smashed when linebacker Phil Villapiano picked off a forced fumble. Fred Bolitnikoff's clutch catch finished the Oilers 17 to 6. The Raiders were atop the AFC West, but on the horizon, the team that hated them most, the Kansas City Chiefs. The Raiders and the Chiefs, 
always a two-fisted, bruising struggle. And on this day, only one would survive in the standings. The silver and black defense stood ready, virtually invincible, and their message was clear. Number 48, Namaya Wilson, came up with a timely interception that helped limit the Chiefs to only seven points. Then the Raider offense zeroed in with the big guns, and the explosion shook the football world. This was the offense that would finish number one in the AFC, and KNBR's Bill King described the relentless role of the on-rushing silver and black wave. Stabler gives the ball here to Hubbard. He breaks a tackle in the 25, the 20, the 15, the 5. Touchdown, Raiders! Marv Hubbard, 31 yards as he hit off the left side. He got a block from Smith. He blew through the hole where Wilbur Young missed him and was off to the races with a fruitless pursuit by Jim Kearney. And Hubbard, with a 31-yard touchdown, gives the Raiders the lead of 13 to nothing. Marv Hubbard did another crunch job. And after the crunch came the crumble as the Oakland defense got it back and the Chiefs were ground to dust 37 to 7. goes in motion from the left and uh, Stabler rises up and throws Branch makes a touchdown catch Raiders there was an incredible play Branch started in motion from the left he stopped behind Upshaw the left guard reversed and came back to the left slanted into the end zone Stabler laid it in his hands now up only the two teams remain and the last regular season game was the only one that mattered the Raiders hairstyles this year have been about as consistent as their play Last week, they made the long trek west a misery for some big-button Kansas City Chiefs faithful. The silver and black, led by number 60, Otis Sistrunk, shut the Chiefs' ground game down completely, allowing only 24 yards rushing all day. The Raiders themselves struck through the air early in the first quarter on a Ken Stabler to Fred Blitnikoff score that Fred celebrated with a casual flair that keeps the Raiders Chiefs rivalry boiling. Of course, the game is always a big one, and died in the wool Kansas City hater Marv Hubbard rose to the occasion with a 31-yard blast up the middle to easy living. A replay shows that once through the line, Marv went unmolested and Oakland led 14 to nothing. Stopped on the ground, Mike Livingston took his team up top where he was intercepted out of bounds by the man who watched the pyramids being built and who added three field goals himself to Oakland's cause. Yes, it was George Blanda who does it all. Mike Livingston did a little himself as he found a way through the Raiders' tough defense. His 17-yard run was nice, but didn't quite put the Chiefs back in it as they trailed 23 to seven. Livingston's luck didn't last long. Number 43, George Atkinson intercepted one pass, which eventually led to an increase in Oakland's lead. The increase came on a 10-yard outside run by Charlie Smith. It looked like the Raiders had once again pounded the Chiefs out of the playoffs. Trying desperately to get back in it, Pete Bethard kept the Chiefs in the air and ran into number 48 in Amaya Wilson's wraith-like steal. The 
Then the proud and poised Oakland Raiders administered the coup de grace as Kenny Stabler hit Cliff Branch and the silver and black had a big win 37-7. Well, old chief, there's always next year. The Raiders had battled back and now faced the final challenge to their championship plans, the Denver Broncos. They forged an early lead, then added to it. It's a big play in this drive right here. Hand off to Davis again, makes to go outside, cuts back in the middle of the five, touchdown Oakland! The Raiders score again! Throughout the year, the aggressive Raider defense allowed only 175 points, 58 less than any previous season. And this intense pressure forced the Broncos to falter. Only the strongest survive in the final quarter of a title game, and on this December day, once again, it was the silver and black who conquered. A big play by the offense, and then another by the defense, rendered the final verdict 21 to 17. Kenny Stabler and Mike Ciani may have just broken the hearts of all of Denver, Colorado, with a 31-yard bomb. Stabler went to Ciani, who made a late break at about the eight-yard line, blew by Calvin Jones, and then floated high in the air to make a magnificent catch of that football. Washington to the left now. Up, back to pass is Ramsey. Pumps, runs out of the pocket, throws on the move, and it's intercepted by Skip Thomas on a deflection at the 45. Thomas running around to use up time. they driving out of bounds with one second to go, and the Raiders are in. The ball was deflected off Riley Odom's high, stretched fingertip. There's the gun. The ball game is over. The Raiders, for the sixth time in seven years, win the Western Division of the American Football Conference. First and ten, Pittsburgh 39. Barry Pearson left, Lewis to the right. He sets up, he looks, passes batted up in the air. Philip Piano intercepts at the 40-yard line of the Raiders. One of the Raiders in rushing pass rushers. Again goes Bradshaw. He's looking for Barry Pearson. He's throwing far down the middle, overthrown, intercepted by Atkinson at the 28. He's at the 30. He brings it back to the 38. Spikes the football as he's tackled by Barry Pearson. Oakland has its third interception of the day. Bradshaw sets up, then lobs one out to the left, broken up, intercepted. Willie Brown at the 50, Willie really at the 40. He's at the 30, the 20, the 10, the 5. Sam has exploded as the great veteran Willie Brown tipped the pass intended for Pearson. Bobbed it into the air so he could grab it at the 50 and outraced everybody to the end zone. A 50-yard interception returned by Willie Brown. Suddenly the Raiders are leading by 15 with Blanda trying to tack on another one. With design and desire, the awesome Raider juggernaut ripped out huge chunks of Steeler turf. Time and time again, they drove to the end zone door and then battered it down. In the end, it was Raider pride that dominated the day with a resounding 33 to 14 victory. A triumph saluted with a standing ovation by the ecstatic Oakland fans. to the game, the Raiders had stated that if they were to score against Pittsburgh, it would have to be with defense and special teams, because they felt it was impossible to dent the steel curtain with sustained drives. But in their very first possession, the Raiders went to ball control tactics, and this 20-yard sweep by Marv Hubbard showed just how clearly Oakland had taken control of the line of scrimmage. Grinding out yardage in sizable chunks, the Raiders ate up almost 10 minutes of the first quarter, accomplishing what they themselves had called the impossible. 
And on the 16th play, Marv Hubbard smashed the final yard, capping an 82-yard drive to give the Raiders a 7-0 advantage. Unable to establish a running game, Terry Bradshaw got the Steelers moving late in the period when he hit Dave Williams with his 14-yard gain into Oakland territory. But two plays later, number 60, Otis Sistrunk deflected this Bradshaw aerial, and Oakland's Phil Villapiano caught it on the carom to end the Steelers' advance. Beginning the second quarter, Kenny Stabler dumped this pass to Mike Siena for a 21-yard gain to the Pittsburgh 35-yard line. But it appeared that Pittsburgh had weathered a rocky start. Beginning the third quarter, Kenny Stabler moved the Raiders into field goal range the first two times Oakland owned the football. And George Blanda paid off those efforts with field goals of 31 and 22 yards, boosting the Raiders' lead to 16 to 7. But no terminal harm had been done to the Steelers' cause, and then lightning struck in the form of Willie Brown. Eschewing the running game and going up top to get the Steelers moving, Terry Bradshaw aimed a pass for Preston Pearson, but Willie Brown, making the play of the day, stepped into action and returned the stolen football 54 yards for a 23-7 advantage. A repeat of the play shows that the confident Oakland cornerback was playing the ball and not the man, and his gamble paid off when Bradshaw's throw was slightly underneath its target. An isolated look at Brown on the play prior to his interception shows that Bradshaw had sent number 83, Barry Pearson, by Brown to draw the Raiders' corner out of the flat area. But on the next play, never taking his eyes off the quarterback, Willie Brown refused to pick up Pearson and played the ball instead. Brown's game-breaking play left Terry Bradshaw with no other option but to throw. And following the ensuing kickoff, two plays later, Bradshaw put the ball again in the air with the same result. A repeat of the play shows that Bradshaw overshot his intended receiver, Frank Lewis, and that the Raiders' number 43, George Atkinson, playing deep like a center fielder, picked the ball off easily. Number 23, Charlie Smith, then swept left for 40 yards deep into Steeler territory. But the Raiders could not push it across, and at the top of the fourth quarter, George Blanda booted a 10-yarder, making good on his fourth field goal of the day. Blanda's boot made the score 26-7, and Pittsburgh looked beaten embarrassingly early as the Raiders' hungry defenders swarmed all over the Pittsburgh attack. But showing the resilience that characterizes good football teams, with Marv Hubbard doing most of the work, the Raiders ended the day the way they began it, blowing the mighty steel curtain defenders right off the line of scrimmage. As the Steelers coach Chuck Noah was to say later, Willie Brown's interception was the key play, but no one play ever beats you. They beat hell out of us all day on every play. They blew us out.
With 35 seconds remaining, Marv Hubbard gained his 91st yard for the day, smashing over to give Oakland a very satisfying 33-14 victory over the Pittsburgh Steelers. Keeping alive the grandiose dream in Oakland of double dynastic domination in professional football and Major League Baseball. But this was a day for the silver and black. The day struck with pride and poise, like the California sunset, which served only to remind the Oakland Raiders of their upcoming date. Series, the Raiders mounted a strong drive that was killed by a heartbreaking penalty. Miami came right back and powered in for the score. The Dolphins had won 23 straight in the Orange Bowl, and Raider efforts went for naught. Oakland had 10 points, Miami 27, and the Raider season ended.